It's a joy to be back with you this evening, and especially for the third Sunday of the month, which is question and answer Sunday night. So we are going to go over several questions that have been submitted. And one of the questions deals with the Lord's Supper that was just done with, and the question pertains to the number of times uh, we're to take the Lord's Supper. The question says, if we're to take the Lord's Supper once on Sunday, then why do we take it twice on Sunday? Well, let me ask you the question. Let me ask it this way. How many times did I take that this morning? How many times did you take it today? Once. Now, just because someone missed the morning service doesn't mean they can't take the Lord's Supper. And it doesn't mean we can't pray for them to take the Lord's Supper. In fact, you know, when we have the Lord's Supper, whether it be in the morning or in the evening, there's nothing to tell that tells us about what we are to do before taking the Lord's Supper. Do we pray? Do we sing? Uh, do we say a communion thought? Uh, we do that by tradition to get our hearts and minds ready for the taking of the Lord's Supper. Uh, to me, if someone wanted just to go ahead and serve the Lord's Supper without saying a thing, they'd be all right. There's nothing there that tells us that we need to pray before we offer the Lord's Supper. But in any event, we do that as tradition. We think it's a good thing that prepares our hearts and minds for it. That being said, when we take the Lord's Supper, we've taken the Lord's Supper. And so all of us who were here this morning took the Lord's Supper. Now, we come back in the evening, and uh, we don't take the Lord's Supper. Only those who missed now have the opportunity to take the Lord's Supper. And we pro provide that as a convenience for those who have missed the morning service. So we're not taking the Lord's Supper twice on Sunday. We're offering it, but we're not taking it. All of us are not taking it twice. We're taking it once and only once. So I think that hopefully that answers the question. Are there any comments? Yes, sir. One question for you. What well, Romans were they The, what's wrong with taking the Lord's Supper twice or ten times during the Sunday? I suppose if anyone wanted to take it, they could. Right? Yeah, there's, there's nothing, uh, nothing that says we have the example of a church coming together to partake of the Lord's Supper, but there's no indication as to why or when they can take or as to uh, how many times on the first day of the week they can take it. Well, we should tarry one for another. We should tarry for one, one for another, and that's exactly why we have this opportunity now that we can give others uh, that opportunity. You know, back in the old days, especially during World War II, uh, uh, you know, times were given. I have to say, this might come as a surprise, the, uh, and I'm not sure exactly where it came from, but um, meeting twice on Sunday is relatively a new phenomenon among churches. You know, back in the 1800s, uh, J.W. McGarvey, if you know who he is, uh, was a pioneer in the Churches of Christ in the 1800s. And he gave a detailed account of Sunday service. And Sunday service consisted of the Lord's Supper, which lasted an hour itself. Think about that. They provided an hour for the folks to partake and to mentally discern the Lord's body and the Lord's blood on that day. Short talks were given around the Lord's table about the crucifixion. And so uh, that lasted an hour or so, he says. Uh, and so that was part of the worship service. Now, there was preaching regular sermon, and then of course singing, and prayers offered. So they had a quite an extensive day of worship. And so uh, I'm not saying, now we don't do that. That doesn't mean we're wrong. It's just the way they did it, and we do something different. Uh, I've heard recently, in the last several years, and I can't remember who it is, um, but there is a congregation that uh, decided that they wanted to give more importance to it. So they extended their Bible class earlier, I think, and then extended the worship service to two hours. And the whole first hour is songs and prayers and scripture readings around the Lord's Supper. And then we'll go to a more general lesson for the next hour. And I think that's a great idea. I think when it comes to
the Lord's Supper, uh, you know, what better thing to do than to think about the Lord during that day and think about, you know, have uh, songs dedicated to it and prayers and speeches given, short speeches. Uh, that's where we get, there was a book written years ago for uh, men and for training men to lead in the church and uh, short talks around the table. Well, that that comes from the, the McGarvey era. That They had several short talks around the, uh, the Lord's table. So that's why it took an hour. Of course, prayer is involved. And there was enough time given uh, for introspection, personal introspection. Uh, well, also that kind of went by the wayside with the invention of the car. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Because uh, early on, you had to travel by wagon to the church. So you spent the entire day there, and you had Sunday lunches there, and you had, you know, and it was all day, and you did. You carried together all day, leaving just in time to get home before dark. That's right. And so part of it is just logistics. Yeah, it is. Part of it is logistics. And so the elders, you know, with their wisdom and leading the congregation, um, they determine the, the times and so when they determine the times and the times are set, we ought to be there because what does the Bible say about the eldership? It says that we all must submit to the eldership, to their, their leading. And so uh, if we violate those, if we violate submitting to the elders, then we're violating God. We're violating a divine decree. While they, uh, there's nothing in the Bible that says you have to meet twice, but if the elders come along and they decided to say, we think it best for the benefit of the church and for the growth of the church, spiritually speaking, that this is best for, for us. And so we must uh, uh, follow their, their guidance. Yeah. And then the rest of the whole, what does that really mean? It's, oh, must be 
specific sentences to describe it. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, when I was in college, so there were uh, some youth uh, ministry majors, I believe, that were kind of facetiously talking about some stuff. But, uh, they said, well, Jesus said, as often as you come together, do this in remembrance of me. So we should be taking communion on Wednesday night, too. And uh, that was kind of a, like, I remember that one specific sentence out of that conversation. Right. You know, Jesus does say that as often as you eat this bread, drink this cup, you know, proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. And Paul takes that and he quotes it in 1 Corinthians 11. And, uh, but Jesus wasn't saying anytime you take it, he's talking to, remember, he's talking to his, his disciples, his apostles. And then he says, because I won't drink, drink this blood again till I meet with you again in the kingdom. And so we come to the kingdom and we find that the kingdom was established and they're taking the Lord's Supper. So that means Jesus is also partaking with them of the supper. And what are they taking it? The first day of the week. So when Jesus said, as often as you do this, you do so in remembrance of me, the as often is then defined. Remember, Jesus is saying this before the church is established. The church is established and then the rule is set. The first day of the week first day of the week. And so again, like we said this morning about having a pattern. There's a pattern to follow. There's Christ's pattern of behavior and obedience and what to say and do and think. And there's also the words of the apostles. Right? And the words of the apostles and their teaching. The teaching shows us when they did it. So we have that pattern. And there's no other pattern given but theirs. So we follow that pattern. And that's why we take the Lord's Supper on Sunday as opposed to Saturday or every day or any other day. But Sunday, the first day of the week, because that's what they did. And we want to we want to be like them. We want to be like the church we read about in the first century. Do what they did, right? If we do what they did, they say we get what we get what they what they got. And if they got what they got, then we're gonna get what they got. <laughs> so uh, we want to be that church. We want to be the church of the New Testament. I, uh, I don't know this uh, ministry in Japan, and I uh, was a missionary there for a good while. And he said when he first got there, he met with a small congregation that had been read and, and uh, uh, worship and all that. And they didn't have the Lord's Supper, and they didn't have uh, unleavened bread and uh, fruit and wine. And uh, I believe he said something about they used Pepsi and something else, a piece of bread of some kind. And they used that before the Lord was solid. And I, I thought, well, that would be tough for me to do. I, I, I would have to I would have to say, why don't we just do this later? Right. Uh, or something like that. I, 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 that could not possibly represent the, the sacrifice of Christ. We know that, because this is what he said to the of. But he said, I didn't know what to do, but they're very proud people, and I didn't want to I didn't want to, you know, have a fight with them right there over this, you know. And he said, I really didn't know what to do. And so we just looked at it as the Lord suffered. And I, right. I don't know. Uh, that now, now, there's a time and place for everything. You don't want to disrupt the service. And so out of etiquette, Christian etiquette, uh, Christian graces would preclude that we take that outside afterwards and say, hey, you know, do what a, do a, a Priscilla and Aquila do. Take them aside and tell them the right way and do that. I think, you know, sometimes we forget that when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, he was doing something. They were celebrating the feast of the Passover. And that was done with unleavened bread and unfermented juice. Right. Of the bread. And uh, that's part of the teaching process originally instituted you know, but have to be part of it to teach them why you don't use just regular crackers and, and those things you know, because he used what he had at hand which was unleavened bread and fruit of the juice of the body mm -hmm. and so we use that example right and also it, it, it helps us to it'll help you to remember that part of the 
representation. It's a representation of sin. That's why when you celebrate the feast, when they celebrate the feast of Passover, they got rid of all their leaven. Leaven is a type of fermentation. Mm -hmm. That's right. And it just makes it bad. <laughs> well, how much stuff is in the Bible if you just can if it's not something we made up. That's what he had. That's what he used. So if he's saying, why, why would we change it? And if the idea of leaven, uh, if, the, if the leaven corrupts things, then we often, we have to say, well, his body wasn't corrupt. So we take the unleavened bread, which represents his pure body. Right? And the unfermented grape juice, if you will, the, represents his unstained blood. And so while Jesus became a sacrifice, a sin sacrifice, he didn't have any sin himself. You know, in the Bible it says he took on our sin and became sin for us. Well, he didn't become sin as the way it's, it, that's an, uh, an idiom that was used. Becoming sin means became a sin sacrifice. He didn't become sin because if he became sin, then he's not a perfect sacrifice. He's a blemished sacrifice. And the same idioms are used in the Old Testament as well. That's why we know they're Hebrew idioms. Uh, sacrifice. A sin became sin for us means a sin sacrifice. Seeking the spirit through the letter, and that's 
Avengers. Oh my God, that's right. Uh, man, we're we're not seeking to be on the righteousness of the Pharisees. We're seeking to do what Jesus said. If you love me, you will obey my commands. And to do that, you have to understand. And if there's any little thing that we don't understand, we should kind of obsess over it to make sure that we understand the entire word. Exactly. So that we can do the entire word. Exactly right. So when we are bound to the terms and the stipulations and the pattern found in the New Testament for what we do in worship, then we are uh, we find ourselves having to do that without doing something else. And if we do something else, we know that we've gone astray. We've done something that's not an ex- an ex- that's why we say that the old expression that came out of the Restoration was. In, uh, that for Bible authority, there must be what? There must be a divine command, an explicit statement. There must be apostolic example or divine example. And there must be implication. It used to be inference. But we, we infer what God implies. So it's by implication God says things or does things. So uh, we infer from the implication what God has implied. So we learn by that. And if there's no example, and if, if there's no pattern, then we're, we shouldn't be doing that. Right? And only if there's an example and a pattern for us. That's why we, that's why we stick to that. And I think uh, people say, well, you just want to be safe. Yes. <laughs> that's what this is about. <laughs> Our souls are more, should be more important to us than to say, well, I think I can do that, right? Or we're, then we're basing our soul on, I think I can. But as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And also, you know, there is a way that seems right to a man, the way he thinks, but at the end of that way is death. So if we just stick to what God says and, and he gives us the pattern within the pattern, he says, do not go to the left. I think I can. Do not go to the right. I think I can. But do exactly as he says. You can't go wrong. We stand on the promises of God. That's what we're doing. So, are there any other questions or comments concerning that? So, we went from the Lord's Supper to lots of other things. Amen. Uh, let's see. If God knows we are going to heaven or hell, why do we then have to live? Go? Why do we have to go through life? <laughs> What's the point of living? <laughs> uh, it kind of reminds me of uh, what Paul said in Second Corinthians four. Uh, he says, "We live in this tabernacle. We groan in this tabernacle, but we eagerly await." for the tabernacle made from above. Uh, so yeah, there's a, I guess there's an example for us to, to say, uh, why do we have to go through this? And, uh, and Paul was saying the same thing in different words. But uh, the point is this, that uh, he allows us to go through life this way so that we turn to him and that we turn to him and remain faithful to him. And so it's all about choice and decision for us. Now, if he had determined that Doug was going to go to hell or heaven uh, and nothing was, you know, I don't know that, right? I don't know where I'm going to be. So I have to make the right decisions in order to go to the place I want to go to. And so, but God knows already where Doug is going to be, right? And so... Um, what was that song years ago about the guy's girlfriend dying and so I gotta I gotta work real hard to get to heaven or something like that you remember you guys in the 50s know that song or 60s what was it the last kiss the last kiss okay yeah so and I gotta get to heaven to see my baby so and that's that's the point right and so we're gonna do all we can to get there And there's a lot of people I want to see. I want to see Jesus, and I want to see the apostles, and I want to see 
my life, and I want to see all the people that have been a part of my life. That's that's horrible to me, and uh, and so it's important for for me to to make those right choices in life. And so that's why he does it, even though he knows he still allows us to make those those right choices. Can you please explain Hebrews chapter twelve, verse eighteen? All right. Hebrews 12 and verse 18. It says, For you have not come to the mountain that may be touched and that burn with fire, and to blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words so that who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. For they could not endure what was commanded and if so, much as he uh, as a beast touches the mountain, it still be stoned or shot with an arrow. And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I am exceedingly afraid and trembling. Well, we find here this, uh, this idea uh, when the uh, Israel, the Hebrews were outside Mount Sinai and uh, they heard God speak and they trembled and they said, ah, oh, we can't take that. We are scared out of our wits when God speaks. There's no way that we can approach this God. So Moses, you're the guy. And Moses hears the voice and he says, man, you want me to go? <laughs> you kidding? And, uh, but he does. And, uh, and so he trembles and he's terrified and so about the voice of God. And so Moses goes up and he speaks with God and he gets the Ten Commandments and, and all of that. He says, as he continues, he says in verse 22, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn. So what he's talking about here is... Uh, about that incident back in that time and he's making a New Testament application and the, and the thing about it is he's talking about the going away of the old covenant and the ushering in of the new covenant and as he said before if, if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast and every disobedience received a just reward how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? We read that in chapter 2. Now that, that point, that concept, is carried all the way through the book of Hebrews. In other words, the Old Testament was great, but we got something greater in the New Covenant. So let's listen to Christ, and let's listen to his word, and not Moses, and let's not go back to Moses, which is what these people were doing. So if... When God spoke and it troubled the mountains and shook the mountains and the people were afraid and that was under the Old Testament law, how much more, how much more terrifying can it be than to look at the law, this new covenant, and then to spurn it, to do away with it, to run away from it, to reject it, or to minimize it in any way? And as he continues, he says uh, again about this Mount Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, verse 23, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn. The church of the firstborn, uh, that's not Jesus, firstborn. Um, the church of the firstborn, and the firstborn there is plural. So it's church of the firstborn ones is what that is saying. So the church is made up of the firstborn ones who were born again, right? So the firstborn ones were the Hebrews, 
uh, into the church, the Jews, and then the Gentiles. So to the general assembly, the church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. So again, uh, the idea here is that with the, with the passing away of Judaism, there is now a better covenant, a new covenant, to which we can hold to. And Paul is encouraging them to maintain holding their convictions to that new covenant. And so that's what the mountain was shaking, and that's what uh, the idea is being spoken of. Are any comments on that? Ben, you were there. You can tell us about it. <laughs> himself, figuratively, well, yeah, literally and figuratively, but he took the blood, figuratively speaking, and he sprinkled it. Right? And so, therefore, uh, he, as a high priest, did that for us. Well, I'm just going to say, uh, the Bible says Hebrews, it's Hebrews, right? Yeah. Abel did that by faith. Yeah. And faith comes how? By hearing. And so, God told him what he wanted. And God was displeased with Cain's offering. And how could, why would God be displeased with his offering if he hadn't spoken to Cain the same thing he told him? Hey, that's right. And what a lot of people don't understand is that when, you know, because there's an account given that doesn't have all the facts, you come across other passages that then contain certain facts that fit that narrative, that fit what happened. So we get back to what David said. The sum of thy word is true. You put all the parts together. All the constituent parts make a whole. And when you have the whole, you have the truth. And what Ben is alluding to is the fact that although God, we don't have it in writing, God did not say to uh, Cain and Abel that you're going to uh, give me a sacrifice from the firstlings of your flock. It's implied because we read it elsewhere about coming from faith. Their faith came from the word of God. So in order for them to present a sacrifice, the sacrifice had to be by faith, which comes from God's word, right? And so there was no written law, but there was a spoken law, and that's what the patriarchal people lived under, that spoken law from Adam to Abraham. All right, yeah. And then they lived under law that shook the earth. That's right. Okay. And then they lived under a law that shook not only the earth, but the heavens as well, the greater law of all the earth. Exactly right. That's a great, great illustration right there. And that's exactly what God's word is telling us. And so again, how great is the New Testament? How great, how privileged are we uh, to live under that which only those people could only imagine who lived in the under, under the old law. They didn't have any idea. We have 2020 hindsight, as they say, as to all that took place. And then, of course, the Bible tells us that all that took place served as an example for each of us. So all those people back then were just examples for us. They were the types 
for the antitype, the real thing. Okay. And along with that, I know there's a one in Hebrew. Oh, here it is. Um, Hebrews 12, 15. Can you explain that one too? So uh, <laughs> go to Hebrews 12, 15. So just before 18. And this is talking about uh, Esau. And it says in verse 15, looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person. Profane is opposite of sacred. The Bible says don't make the sacred profane. Keep the sacred sacred. And keep it separated from the profane, from the fleshly, from the worldly, from the sinful things. So, uh, as he continues, he says, Let there be, uh, lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance though he sought it diligently with tears. Well, uh, so we know the story of Jacob and Esau, right? Do I have to explain that story? All right, so Jacob tricked Esau, or tricked Isaac, and uh, he tricked, him, tricked his dad, thinking that he was Esau, because Esau was very a very hairy man, uh, and so, so maybe that's where the apes were back then. I was very scary. I don't know. So he was a very hairy man, and Isaac was blind and old, and he felt his hand and uh, his arm, and he says, "Ah, okay, that's Esau." He goes, so he gives us, he gives Jacob the blessing, thinking he's given to Esau. And the reason he was doing that was because Esau decided that he would sell his birthright. And uh, this is what happened. So what should have been Esau's becomes Jacob's. See how God works in divine providence and the way things work out? Because it's through the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. No. <laughs> Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that we get Christ, not Esau. So uh, it's funny how that lineage, therefore, is presented in like fashion. So, uh, he has his blessing taken away from him, and then it says that he was trying to, uh, he knew that he couldn't get it back. Once the, the father blesses the, the, uh, the son, you can't take it back. You can't change it. You can't alter it. So, and Esau knew that. So, there was no sense of repenting on Esau's part because there's no way he could get it back. Can't say, I'm sorry, Dad. Can you have a do-over? Can we take a mulligan here? And uh, he can't do that. So, so it says here, uh, for you know that afterward when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected for he found no place for a change of mind. Repentance. Though he sought it differently, uh, diligently with tears. So, uh, you know, he wanted it really badly, but, uh, you know, we, we suffer the consequences of our decisions, and that's what this is about. Uh, the things that uh, we do in life, the choices that we make, have extreme consequences. And this is one of them. And it worked out for our advantage that Jacob was the one, and not his you read that story in, the, in Genesis. It says that Esau came in from hunting and he was hungry. And Jacob said, I'll give you something what I'll fix for your birthright. And he said, well, what good is your birthright? Because he, I don't know if he was overacting or what, but anyway, he says, what good is your birthright going to do me if I perish or what have you? Sold his birthright to Jacob outright. And you better be careful, would you? And that birthright was 
I mean, the most important thing in, in that kid's life, right? It should have been, and he should have thought about it that way. And that's why God rejected him. That's where you know, the Edomites come from, from Esau. And uh, it said, uh, Jacob he loved, but Esau, Edom, he hated. But wasn't that just the opposite? For what? <coughs> he, uh, he gave up his birthright, okay? It was more than just giving up a birthright. It was, he was turning his back on the grace of God because he did not trust God to provide for him. That's right. Instead, he chose to have a man provide for him in place of that birthright. Exactly right. That inheritance is that of the divine inheritance. That's what it was about. And that comes from the patriarchs, right? And so they have direct contact with God. So Jacob then, therefore, becomes a patriarch himself. Any comments, questions? Well, we're out of time. Aren't you guys lucky? There's several more to go here. But again, uh, please, uh, if you have questions, uh, Cynthia had a question today about Jacob's ladder that she, she gave to me. We'll probably get that next time. But uh, if you have questions, there are some sheets back there. Write them down and hand them to me. Or uh, if you don't want me to know it's you asking the question, then put it in the suggestion box out there or give it to someone else to give it to me. Uh, that's fine. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm never going to tell who it is that gave the question anyway. But I don't know who it is. <laughs> Uh, if there's anyone here in need of prayers in the church, church congregation, uh, if there's anyone here who uh, desires to restart their lives uh, for Jesus, and you have that opportunity now, as together we stand and sing. <laughs>